Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you uh, to our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream by entering this virtual meeting room. You give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please go to the LinkedIn live video feed, the link to which I have just placed in the chat room. For a better experience, uh, excuse me, this show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please write in the chat room, turn on your microphone to say hi, and we'll be delighted to hear from you. Our guests uh, tonight, our featured guests, are Amy Nam, a harpist and composer, and Mark Webster, a videographer, producer, and audio engineer. Amy and Mark, together with Sean Calhoun, produced the collab collaborative project, The Harp at the End of the Universe, which is the subject of tonight's show. Amy, welcome. Thank you, Simeon. Amy, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your work. I live in Minnesota, and I lead a freelance career composing, performing, and teaching. My motivation is to nourish my curiosity, my students' curiosity, my listeners' curiosity. I think curiosity is important because it is hard for true curiosity to coexist with arrogance. Because when you're curious, you're always finding out what you don't know. And in that sense, it's almost a spiritual practice to cultivate one's curiosity. And in that, because of that, I'm always trying to read as much as I can and expose myself to different ideas as much as possible and so my work as a musician is about taking in all those different ideas and then creating some kind of response out of those different things okay we'll get into it in just a moment i'd like to welcome first mark webster mark hi hi thank you mark tell us about yourself and your work sure my name is mark webster i live in rochester new york and i run a recording studio blue on blue Sorry, here's my microphone. <laughs> Run a recording studio, Blue on Blue Recording. Um, in my background, I, I originally was playing in bands, rock bands, blues bands, jazz bands, any kind of band I could get in. I just loved music. Uh, but eventually I found what I really, really loved was the studio, the recording studio. And I, I came to think of the recording studio as just another instrument. So keyboard is my main instrument, but um, I kind of think of the recording studio as my instrument now. So um, that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years or so, running the recording studio. And in particular, um, I have a particular love of working with uh, classical musicians and recording their, their, their inspirations, their pieces, their compositions, and, and figuring out how to make them into uh, uh, music videos. So that's been kind of a little bit of a specialty, working with classical musicians and making music videos like this wonderful video that uh, Amy Nam inspired. So tell us, Mark, about that. Tell us, so you're an audio engineer, you're you're doing these, you're getting into these music videos for classical music, which is <clears> not uh, not so common. Tell us about this one uh, that you've created with Amy. How <clears> did it all uh, come about? Uh, this one started, I was playing in the studio with this whole idea of like, wow, wouldn't it be neat if you could figure out how to make sound more visual music more visual since i was thinking of music videos and so i was trying a bunch of ideas and 
Um, I must have gone through a different dozen ideas that didn't really work until I, 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 I was playing around with a cello and I put the camera on the cello strings and, and ended up setting the shutter to this really, really fast rate. And suddenly it froze the strings and you could see, I mean, I intellectually know that a string vibrates, you know, like this, but I'd never actually really seen it. And suddenly with the camera on these kind of extreme settings, you could see the cello string moving. I went, wow, that would be a really awesome music video. So I started, and it turned out I had just seen like the night before I had seen Amy Nam play that exact harp concerto that that uh, Simon was sharing at the very beginning. And uh, I had been introduced to her and I absolutely loved her music. And then I realized, wait, why just use a cello string when you could use a harp string? Because harps have all those strings. It would be an amazing video. So anyway, I, I bounced the idea of uh, off of Amy and she was game for it. So anyway, that's how the whole video got started was this idea of how to how to be able to visualize music. And Amy was gracious enough to run with the idea and ended up writing an entire piece about it. Um, what's kind of unusual about this is that usually what happens is in the recording studio is usually you, you uh, a person writes a piece of music, then they record the piece of music and then they make a music video out of it. That happens like virtually all the time. This one actually was all in the complete reverse. Um, I met Amy and I got together. We came up with some video ideas that looked cool. We got together with her harp and a camera and we just, here, Amy, try that. And Amy said, what if I try this? And we made a whole list of all the things that looked cool. And then Amy wrote the piece based on all those little ideas that looked cool. So this is literally, a, you know, Amy wrote the piece for the video, which is something I've never seen before. So this is kind of the reverse process. Uh, and I find that really exciting. And, and lots of new ideas came up because of that kind of backwards process in making this. Wow. Okay. So Amy, if I understand Mark right, so he's looking at these, uh, into these micro aspects of the cello. I can, uh, so so like under a microscope and you get these very, very small things that your eye can't perceive. And then you have this uh, idea about the, the the universe, the cosmos and the other side of that, the macro side, which is so big that we can't see. Tell us about this. Yeah, that's um, a great way of putting it. We have the tiny thing and then the huge thing. And I think there's a lot of uh, beauty and interest in that extreme uh, contrast. And in addition to zooming in on the strings, I decided to make the pieces very, very short to really um, kind of drive home the the difference between <laughs> these unfathomably large time scales and the, our very short uh, human attention span. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share some uh, images. You can see my chicken scratch here. The, these were the notes that I took away from my meeting with Mark. So and it's wow. very cryptic. Um, <laughs> I have like, so this stuff at the bottom, I have the pitches, and then I have whether they're in sharp, natural, or flat. And then I kind of had the speeds. You know, I classified the different speeds of the strings in my head. Oh, like these pitches looked fast and these looked slow. And sometimes the, the strings looked like they were moving in a certain direction. And so I have all this uh, stuff that only makes sense to me. And I don't even think it makes sense to me anymore. It made sense to me at the time. <laughs> so I was getting those ideas um, from, from Mark. And at the same time, I was reading this book called The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, by Dr. Katie Mack. And it is about the different cosmological models for the end of the universe. Um, so I decided to use each model as a movement for the piece. So um, there are basically four main ideas that scientists have for how they think everything will end one day. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that we're gonna be around forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first idea, uh, which a lot of people have heard of is called the heat death. And so basically, if you um, look around right now, you can see that 
galaxies are getting farther away, everything's getting farther apart. Um, we observe something called the microwave, cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and if we extrapolate that backwards in time, uh, we see that everything looks like it came from the singularity. And that's what we know as the Big Bang that had this energy exploding out. And basically, since then, everything uh, has been getting further and further apart. And if this continues, everything is just going to get really, really far apart indefinitely. And eventually, even objects like the Earth are going to break down into fundamental particles that are going to get further and further apart or everything will get um, subsumed into black holes, and then the black holes are going to decay into radiation, and eventually everything is just going to reach a maximum state of disorder. And at that point, nothing can happen anymore. So that it doesn't maybe like end, like annihilate, but it's going to just reach a point where everything's as far out as it can be, and it can't get any more disordered. And so that's the heat death. Nothing will happen at the end of the heat death. And it's hard to even imagine, you know, the time scales involved. Um, so another possibility is that everything will end in a big crunch. So basically, if the initial energy that threw everything apart is not great enough to overcome the force of gravity, which is attracting everything back together, um, the universe might kind of do this thing where it, you know, expands, slows down, and then comes back into another singularity where we don't know what will happen at that point because we can't even... Um, think about like how hot that would be and how dense the whole universe at that single point would be if that happens it's going to get really exciting at the end and like there's going to be plasma and there's going to be like nuclear explosions happening and there's going to be like radiation like zooming around and it's going to be like super exciting like super intense um so then there's another scenario called the big rip and the big rip is actually like the heat death, except that instead of just getting uh, farther and farther apart at a constant rate, it's going to just like rip apart at the end and get like uh, super fast and like, you know, the earth is just going to like rip apart and then particles are going to like rip apart. And um, all of these things are possible depending on um, what we find out is true about dark energy. Um, I'm going to show a little chart here that helps us visualize the different models. Um, so on the y-axis, this is the scale of the universe, and the x-axis is hmm. time. The middle thread right here is um, basically the heat death. So if the universe gets larger and larger, but kind of at this constant rate, the big rip, you can see it starts to get larger and larger at ever shorter time scales. And then over here, the big crunch is where the universe actually gets smaller again. And again, it kind of happens faster and faster as time goes on. Um, okay, so those are kind of three similar versions of one idea. There's a fourth possibility. Um, and Dr. Mack in her book says, about this possibility rests on the hypothesis that our universe has a kind of fatal instability built into it. So this fourth hypothesis is sometimes called vacuum decay. It's sometimes called the quantum bubble of death. I, I called it the quantum bubble of doom in this piece because I thought that sounded kind of exciting and dramatic. <laughs> and so the whole idea here is that even space that you think is empty isn't actually empty. There's some kind of invisible quantum field in it that has a certain energy associated with it. And um, this is called the Higgs field. And it's thought that the Higgs field interacts with everything. And the Higgs field interacting with everything is what gives particles their mass and their charge and their properties. 
And um, this one is a little bit harder to understand. So I'm gonna quote Dr. Mack here. She says, you can think of the Higgs field as a pebble rolling down a slope into a valley with the potential, the potential energy represented by the shape of that slope. And just as a pebble will settle in the bottom of a valley, the Higgs field will seek the lowest energy state where the potential is at its lowest value and it will settle there, assuming nothing stops it. Now, the problem is that might not really be the bottom. So I'm gonna show another image here. So here we kind of have the energy of the Higgs field represented on the y-axis. And here's our pebble. So right now, the Higgs field has settled into the lowest possible value for itself, and it can't get over this hump. But if this hump exists and there is a lower value for the energy of the field, something might happen that could flip the energy at one single point in space from this higher state of energy into this lower state of energy. And if that happens, basically it sets off a chain reaction where all the points around that point then switch into the lower energy and it just like keeps expanding at the speed of light. And it would just fundamentally change any matter that was in its path until it like consumes the entire universe. And the good news about this one is that it would happen so fast that we wouldn't see it coming. We wouldn't know it when it happens because we'd just be gone. Um, so all of these ideas, those are the four main ideas, and all of these ideas were so much fun translating them into sound, imagining them musically. These are some of my chicken scratches from when I was working on the sketches of the music. Um, this is a sketch from the Big Crunch, and it's maybe hard to see what's going on, but basically I layered a bunch of harp parts. So in post-production, after we recorded everything, we like layered my recordings on top of each other. And over time, you can see my little time codes here. I'm changing the pitches. I'm adding more and more pitches until like I'm just kind of saturating the musical space with all the possible pitches. And it becomes incredibly dense and hot, just like the big crunch would at the end of the universe. Um, and this is the heat death. Um, um, for the heat death, I kind of had several different threads of ideas going on, and then they all kind of get um, more and more out of sync. And um, I kind of have, well, I don't want to over explain it because I think everyone should be able to make their own interpretation of the music, their own connections between the ideas and the music. Um, and then this was a sketch from my quantum bubble of death. Um, yeah, so there was just a ton of fun imagining musical analogies with all of these ideas, these kind of abstract ideas. So I'm making them concrete. I'm making them sonic, which is, well, it's abstract in a different way, I guess. But it's uh, just fun because you know, like music can represent energy in a really unique way. Um, and so, yeah, there is just a lot to explore as a composer. Wow. Okay. So Amy, now tell us, we're going to listen to it. We're going to watch the big, uh, the big crunch. So tell us what should we pay attention to? Should we be paying attention to the, to the video? Should we be attention listening to for something in the music? What, how, where would you like our attention? <laughs> oh, I, I won't, um, I won't try to direct anything. Just enjoy it. Okay. See what, see what jumps out. Here we go.
Wow. That is pretty exciting. <laughs> Applause from the audience. So, um, wow. Mark, tell us a, a little bit. What, what's, your, what's your takeaway then? What's, I mean, that's a fantastic uh, video work. I mean, it's uh, just captivating. Tell us, tell us about it. That was just fun to watch. <laughs> I haven't watched it for a while. That was really fun. Uh, thank you, Amy, for what a great piece. I really, really love that piece. <laughs> um, I have a couple of behind the scenes shots uh, that I could show that shows a little bit about when uh, the process of making this. Um, is that where we are now, Simon? That's perfect. All right. Let me uh, go ahead and share this. This is the studio where we actually made it. This is my studio. This is uh, where we made it. Um, and uh, this is the room where we actually, where Amy was. And uh, this is where we, rec uh, where I was when we were recording it. When we do the video, there's actually a, a, uh, a number of things that go into this. So Amy showed up at least an hour. Was it an hour or two early, Amy, I think? Because uh, we met with a makeup artist who was doing your makeup and your hair for the video. Oh, I think it was a couple hours of makeup. <laughs> At least a couple hours, right? Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, I was getting all the lighting figured out. Uh, and then when she was ready and I was ready, uh, we started putting everything together. So you can see the lighting and the cameras and the harps. Um, there's a black curtain you can see that's or it's actually a black sheet that's back behind um, on the floor and around. So that entire studio here was basically covered with black sheets to make everything black. That's how we got that total black look. Um, and then you just threw on tons of lights at really high intensities because remember we had to make those shutter times super, super fast in order to stop the string so you could see the, see the strings moving. So uh, the lights were like 10 times brighter than you would normally have them. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty bright there. Um, but anyway, just a couple shots of us uh, uh, doing the, doing the scenes. Then we put them all together and, and that's how we made it. Wow. Fantastic. Congratulations to you both. Wow. Um, so final thoughts, a a Amy, right? Why don't we start with a Mark final thoughts? Um, what do you want, people to take away from from this i see those you know the the the, the black and the, and the colors you get out of it i mean that's it's it's amazing from your video work what is it you'd like oh, people to get you. out of it uh i think the thing that's that really impressed me with amy and what the direction she took the music was that i really liked the way that uh, she connected it with astronomy, but actually not just any astronomy, but like these are like the latest theories. I mean, this is really, really like cutting edge, just, you know, in the last decade kind of ideas. So this is really the latest ideas in astronomy. But then she's tying it together with music, which actually is an idea that goes back to ancient civilizations. <laughs> One of the oldest ideas in recorded history. Um, it turned out like back in the, the the days of the Greeks, the Greeks, when they thought about the world, they thought of um, like, like we often think of the Greeks with mathematics and geometry, and that was the way they thought of things. Um, uh, specifically, when they thought of numbers, they thought of mathematics. When they thought of numbers in space, that's how what they thought of geometry. But then it gets really interesting. When it turns out, when they thought about numbers in time, they thought that was music. It's like, well, wow, that's kind of an interesting idea. I never really thought of it that way. And then it turns out when they thought about numbers in space and time, they called that astronomy. <laughs> so to the ancient civilizations, the ancient Greeks, they actually had this very close connection between astronomy and music, or in just gen general, the science and the arts. They didn't think of them as different things. And, you know, to today's society, I know when I was in college, the, the, um, the science department, you want to study math and science was over on this campus over here. If you want to study music, well, you had to get on a bus because it was on a completely different campus downtown. It wasn't even the same building. A 15-minute drive to get to, to uh, the Eastman School of Music for, for music stuff. And the, the ancient Greeks didn't think about it that way. So I, I liked about what Amy did in pulling these two ideas together. And, um, you know, I think there's some value in that. You know, maybe uh, if you're a sciencey person, you know, maybe, maybe uh, 
maybe maybe get, get a little more connected with some music. If you're an arts person, maybe check out some more science. I think uh, it leads to a, it can lead to a more full life and uh, more light way of looking at life and uh, maybe even a, a more full society. So anyway, that's just a thought that comes out of uh, that I get when I watch this video. Fantastic. So Amy, final thoughts. Uh, we're as Mark uh, was uh, talking about uh, literature and uh, our um, historical literature, our uh, humanities literature, it makes me think of the Bible, of course, and how uh, they there's always this reference, at least in the Pentateuch, to man who only knows, you know, time on a very small scale, where as the Lord, you know, ma man's life is simply an exhalation. Tell us what's your takeaway. Oh, absolutely. Um, some people, I think, find the concept of the universe ending to be a little depressing, but I think it's it's so important. I think it's a, another kind of um, uh, kind of spiritual practice to just contemplate these really large time scales because uh, you get a different perspective and some of the things that seemed really important and little annoyances <laughs> they don't seem so important <laughs> when you're uh, got this really broad perspective to look at your life from fantastic uh, let's see how we can stay in touch now uh, first of all, excuse me, no, let's see how we can watch the rest of the video. It's here, youtube.com at harp at the end of the universe. So you have all of the uh, all of the videos right here. There are four of them all together. So they are there to to watch. I'll put this in the chat room right here. There it is. So again, that's youtube.com at harp at the end of the universe. And to stay in touch with Amy, it's amynam.com. Amy, people can reach out to you by clicking on contact. Is that right? Yes. So reach out to Amy with your questions and comments. Let's see how we can stay in touch with Mark. It's blueonbluerecording.com. There's the beautiful, beautiful recording studio. So Mark, people can reach out to you with their questions and comments. Absolutely. If they click on get in touch. Okay, fantastic. Again, that's blueonbluerecording.com. Thank you so very much to Amy Nam and to Mark Webster. Thank you so much for having us. This is a blast. Yeah, thank you. Super fun to share and just to have this. This is a really wonderful conversation. So thank you. So let's, thank you all the audience for coming. Absolutely. So let's take a look at what's coming up next Wednesday. It is Kenneth Wilson, Community Music Center of Boston. What's the difference between an artist and an arts administrator? today? The most innovative music organizations are staffed by professionals who do both at the same time. Take Kenneth Wilson of the Community Music Center of Boston, for example. The singer and actor, his stage name is Caden Gray, uses his artistic practice to inform his work as an administrator of the Music Center, which is Boston Public Schools' largest external provider of arts education. Let's ask Kenneth what his work is all about, and through him, get to know the dynamism of one of the first music organizations chartered to provide equitable access to excellent music education. That is next Wednesday, Kenneth Wilson, Community Music Center of Boston. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simianmorrow.com. Once again, thank you so very much to Amy Nam and to Mark Webster. Thank you to Frederick and Victoria Mulligan. Uh, for, and Agnieszka and Ben Arivole for their support of this show. Thank you also to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese Library you can see behind me. Most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile from New London, New Hampshire, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. Goodbye, and see you next Wednesday. Bye. <laughs>